Okay, so the map of Spain, not nearly as concentrated in terms of growing areas as France. Um, really, the, the main, there are three, you can count them, but in the world of, in the world of, of Spanish wine, there are three primary red growing areas. Rioja being number one, uh, Ribera del Duero being number two, and the third really kind of being uh, Priorat. Uh, which is just west, that red dot that's west of Barcelona. Uh, we are going to be talking about Rioja. Rioja is the lighter purple growing area. Navarra is just kind of hugging it. Just a nice little hug of a region to the right of that, north, to the northeast of it. Uh, and then Ribera del Duero, which we're not talking about today, is the red region that's about 100 miles north of Madrid. Rioja is about 300 miles west of Barcelona, to kind of give you an idea. So three primary red growing areas. Um, Rioja and Ribera del Duero are the two that really require Tempranillo as the main varietal. Priorat is the region that is Garnacha based, Garnache and Carignan based. And so it's very easy to see how France got these varietals. Um, so at the end of Phylloxera, we have this movement of French grape growers and winemakers into Rioja. They basically cross the Pyrenees Mountains, and they end up in Rioja. And they create uh, um, um, a growing culture, a winemaking culture that is like Bordeaux, um, that is, takes on a little bit of Spanish influence. And what I really mean by that is uh, when I say like Bordeaux, they are doing very specific planting, this idea of monoculture. They're planting Tempranillo in very specific sites that best suit that varietal, which kind of makes sense. Um, they then take on kind of this French mentality in terms of production, which is um, this use of barrique. And a barrique is a very specific word that implies Bordeaux style barrels which is a 225-liter barrel or a 55-gallon barrel. When we get to Burgundy, Burgundy is a 250-liter barrel called a piece, like a, like a piece, a P-I-E-C-E, a piece, which is a 250-liter barrel or a 60-gallon barrel, meaning that in Bordeaux, when you put a wine in a barrel, it has more oak surface area than it does volume, and therefore oak takes more of a primary seat in the wine. Um, so we see that very much at the forefront of Tempranillo and Rioja and Ribera del Duero wines. The one exception here is the Spanish influence. And the Spanish influence, understand, you know, Columbus was hired by the Spanish to discover the New World. Uh, there's, for, for hundreds of years, Spanish colonies in America dating back all the way to the early uh, 1500s and uh, in the 16th century. Um, and so the, the, the Spanish-American colonies uh, and the, the monopoly that the Spanish had on those colonies is, is the direct relationship between the use of American oak and Spanish wines versus French oak and American wines. It's, it's easy that uh, Spanish, uh, excuse me, American oak is cheaper than French, than French oak. But the reality is, is that the reason why the Spanish chose American oak was because they had a, a, an easy access to the raw ingredient, the raw commodity, versus having to deal with um, a broker or a, uh, a third party and in the country that's actually right next to them. So over time, American oak, by, as a byproduct, becomes very entrenched, entrenched in Rioja production. Um, the other thing that's uniquely Spanish is, <clears throat> is this idea of of the role that oak plays. Oak is, is meant to be a vessel that, while adds character, it is not meant to be the star of the wine, and it is also meant to protect the wine for long-term aging. So when we talk about Rioja, aging is, is, is a major part of that style. And so a wine needs to be able to not only live up to that style, but aging requirements become a huge part of it. And so I'm going to kind of jump ahead a bit and talk about these aging requirements since we're, we're looking at it. I'll blow this up. Stand by. 
Okay, so you guys are drinking, we're all drinking a Grand Reserva. And you, you need to understand that what we, what we really mean is when we talk about these laws that govern these production is that these are all minimum standards. And minimum standards really are, are the, the, obviously the floor of the production, but anything above and beyond that is really where the producer has the ability to create something a little bit more unique. Obviously the farming is part of that, but sometimes farming is regulated as well, which is really geared towards yield and potential alcohol. So when we talk talking about wine law, Yields, potential alcohol, how much time they have to be aged for, when they can be, re be released, the varietal makeup are all governed by law. So you can see in this image, you have kind of the general aging for Spanish wine. This includes places outside of Rioja and Ribera del Duero. Then we have Rioja, and then we have Ribera del Duero. Um, well, so let's start at the very bottom because that's the wine we're drinking. We're drinking a Gran Reserva. A Gran Reserva is a minimum of five years aging, two years in barrel, two years in bottle, and then it's five years. So that other year has to be made up somewhere, whether that's in barrel or in bottle, but it has to be a minimum of five years. Uh, if you recall, the wine that we're drinking is a six-year aged wine, and it spent 30 months in barrel, 34 months in tank, and then another six months, no, excuse me, yeah. No, it was 30, it was 30 months in barrel, um, six months in tank, and then an additional 34 months in bottle before it was, was released. So these are your, your requirements for, for what is an aged wine. And again, this is very different. We don't see this method of aging anywhere else in the world. And it's not unusual when you go to a producer in Rioja particularly Rioja, sometimes Priorat, where the average number of barrels that a particular bodega has is upwards of 5,000, 10,000 barrels in a, in a particular, uh, in a particular uh, production house. And it's just meant that these wines are for long-term aging. And what's, what's odd is how affordable these wines are. I mean, these are wines that are in production for six years. They don't make any money off of that wine six years. And, and the rule of thumb is, is that a winery, a producer has to basically uh, um, be thoughtful of that wine in the market for four years. You got the, the year that it was released, um, the, probably the year after or two years it's going to take to sell, and maybe another fourth year before somebody drinks it. And then in reality, if you're making wines that are ageable, you have uh, 5, 10, 20 years before you have to really stop thinking about how that wine is performing in the market. So Rioja, in particular, are wines that are aged much more than any other region in the world in terms of their barrel aging. Ribera del Duero is also, also aged, but in Ribera del Duero, we start to see a shift. Um, we see that shift in Rioja too, but really in Ribera del Duero, we see this shift from traditional winemaking into modern winemaking. And modern winemaking really is um, more French in, in reality. And by French, we mean... Uh, more focus on fruit, not on style, not on production, more focus on new oak, more focus on riper, fruity, fruit-driven wines. Um, while they tend to have good acid and tannin and they can live, they are wines that are, are um, a little bit more geared towards the focus of the fruit and of the terroir and on production versus um, kind of this style, which is aging of a wine. Yes, I'm very happy to send that image also. I'm not sure the best way to send these images. Uh, I mean, I can just email you PDFs. I'm not sure how to do that through um, Zoom. Maybe I can play that. Play with that. Yeah, they, they are PDFs. They're also JPEGs. So any observations about the wines as, as they've opened and breathed? Yeah, pour yourself another glass. Do you like the wines? Are you happy you paid for them? For me, the, the Tempranillo has it. The Tempranillo, as it opens and breathes, it's like it's turning a little bit more barnyardy. 
a little bit more rustic. Um, you can definitely tell it's old world savory, obviously dark red fruit. That coconut caramel component is definitely coming through. Definitely get the barnyard. It's not working. No, this hasn't changed, but the flavor of the wine has. The, everything about the wine has changed, but the nose is the same. you go back and taste the Bordeaux, I mean, if you taste the border yeah. after the Rioja, the tannins are very much going to be more pronounced. So don't judge that first taste if you go back to the Bordeaux. Yeah, I know he can't hear us, but I know everyone else can, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. I just really love the, the concentration of fruit on the Bordeaux. I think Daniel's IT department, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to check their resume. Okay, let me get rid of this picture. I'm going to talk about Rioja specifically. Rioja best. <clears throat> so here's a, a zoomed in map of Rioja. Rioja is basically a growing area that is, is situated on the Ebro River, and that's the river that you see running through the three primary growing regions. You have really three growing areas. You have Rioja Alta, Rioja Alavesa, and Rioja Oriental, which formerly was known as Rioja Baja. And we'll talk about these three um, in terms of what's the difference. Um, but the wine that you're drinking, again, if you're buying just a Rioja, regardless of its aging style, it probably is a Rioja that's a blend of fruit from all three growing areas. Um, this idea of <clears throat> a single growing area or a single commune or a single appellation rather, um, like Rioja Alta or Rioja Oriental, uh, typically you will see that on a label, excuse me, see that on a label, but very rarely will you see a, a, a wine that's uh, Rioja Alavesa or, or Rioja uh, Oriental. Most of what we see in the U.S. market, if it is from a single appellation, is Rioja, which is on the label as La Rioja um, and or Rioja Alta. And so Rioja, <coughs> the three regions here, uh, Rioja Alavesa is, um, is further north. Let me back up. Um, it's not shown on this map, but if you, let me pull up the other map, the other Spanish map. Um, okay, you can see where Rioja, the light purple, you can see the Ebro River. To the north of Rioja's Navarra, um, we have basically um, this light green area, which is kind of kava production, if you will. But you can see how large the kava production really is. I mean, it, they're looking for cool climate, high altitude growing for kava production. And so while this looks like a very large growing area for kava, uh, the reality is, is that it's much smaller because there's only so many places within that larger area that's at high enough altitude to get the freshness of fruit that they're looking for. But just north of this, we have the Pyrenees Mountains. So. <clears throat> The reality is, in terms of climate of Rioja, is that the closer you get to the Pyrenees Mountains, the cooler you're becoming, and the more effect the rain shadow has on your production. A rain shadow means no rain, right? You get less rain uh, as a result, and um, as a result, you get a, a more concentration of fruit, but the reality is, is as you get into a cooler climate, you're getting a little bit more austere fruit, acid, is, is dominant, you tend to get greener flavors. Uh, and so the question is, is, do these things ripen to get the body that I'm looking for? And again, body is one of these things that's direct byproduct of its alcohol content. Alcohol content is a direct byproduct of bricks. So the higher the bricks, we can assume that the higher the body of the wine will be. Okay, so when we go back to this, the Rioja map, Rioja Alavesa is closer to the Pyrenees border. It is a slightly higher elevation, slightly cooler region than Rioja Alta. And between those two regions of Alavesa and Rioja Alta, very similar soils. We're talking about calcareous based clay soils, which we tend to see uh, a lot in many regions. This idea, we'll see a theme throughout all of Western Europe of this kind of 
calcareous-based soils. Calcium-based, limestone-based soils is why grafting made sense in the first place and why those rootstocks from Texas and Missouri made a lot of sense in the first place also is that they're used to limestone-based soils. So Rioja Alta, uh, excuse me, Roja Alavesa, much cooler. What you tend to get here are, 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 are wines that are a little bit austere, acid-driven, much fresher style wines, lighter bodied wines. Um, and this would be kind of like, if I were to make an analogy, this would be like the Beaujolais of Spain. You tend to see a lot of carbonic maceration, just light bodied, light oaked, higher acid, fresher, fruitier styled red wines uh, than anything. Uh, Rioja Alta is their primary growing region. This is, it's warmer, uh, it's not as high elevation, and you tend to get a full growing season without nearly as much rain. And um, that's not me coughing or barking, that's Nacho, if you can hear him. He wants to be a part of the class, as always. Um, so Rioja Alta is your main primary growing area. This is where you get your long-lived Tempranillo, Tempranillo um, styled wines. Uh, and then Rioja Oriental, or, or Rioja, formerly known as Rioja Baja. This is primarily Grenache growing area. And so you tend to get a lot of Grenache produced, which is a grape that has uh, more body. Can you close the door? We're going to try to close the door. I don't know what he's, oh, it's horses. Oh, so, okay. There's some guns going off. Nacho does not like it. Um, so Rioja, uh, Baja, Grenache based, warm, even warmer climate, lower elevation growing area. You tend to get more fruit forward style wines, higher alcohol wines, therefore fuller bodied. And so typically, Rioja Oriental is the large purple area. Um, got it. Uh, typically, when you get just Rioja wines, like I mentioned, you tend to get a blend of wines from all, um, all three growing areas. <clears throat> okay. All right, you guys. So I have one more thing to talk about, and then if you have any questions, just let me know. So um, I'm going to talk about, um, let's see. I'm going to talk about Spanish classifications, and this is not unique to Spain, obviously. This is going to take up the whole screen. There's a lot of detail here. I think the thing to understand when we talk about wine law is things are regulated by law, and what's important to understand is that these are, are, are regulations set in place that are really based off of the French system. And the question becomes, why did the French create these systems that everyone else copied? And when I mean everybody else, what I really mean is the EU. So in the EU, there are 27 countries. Until Brexit officially Brexits, um, there are 21 countries within those 27 countries that produce and make wine that all abide by an EU system of wine law that is really entirely based off of the French system of wine law, which is entirely based off of the, the falling out and the outcome of phylloxera. And so to kind of bring this full circle, you know, when we talk about pandemics, particularly phylloxera, the, the outcome is a situation that resulted in wine classifications that regulate and control the production of wine. I, I wanted to talk about um, the, the, the Spanish system in particular, not because it's more complicated, which it is, but mainly because um, it allows you to kind of see kind of the, 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 the extreme situation that we see in classification systems. In France, there's only three steps. We have what is known as in uh, the vino de table, the table wine, which in the Spanish system is the vino de mesa. We have, in the French system, we have the, basically the, a wine of a region, a vin de pays, um, or an IGP wine, which is a wine of a region. In this case, this would be the vinos de la tierra, um, a wine of the land, or a wine of an area, rather. Um, and then we have a wine from a named place, and in this case, that's the Dio. 
uh, and you can see that nearly two thirds of all the vineyards in Spain are classified as a DO region. You know, so that doesn't mean that these wines are quality driven. What it really means is that they have reached some minimum standard for their production. And that minimum standard is really geared towards, again, acceptable varietals, uh, maximum, or excuse me, minimum yields, maximum potential alcohol, uh, when those wines can be produced, what they can be blended with, and so on and so forth. So as you move up this hierarchy, the laws become more strict. Um, what's interesting, what we see in the, the Spanish system that the French system does not have, nor does really any other uh, uh, European region have, is the very last up, the Vino de Pago, which is a, a, is a, a designation given entirely to a producer. Um, it has nothing to do with... Uh, sorry, you guys. <laughs> Freaking dog. <laughs> Jesus. Sorry, you guys. We're we're almost there. Not just I don't know. You, we all love him, but he has his moments. Um, so the Vino de Pago, it's different than all the other classifications because all the other classifications are really geared towards this idea of minimum standards for a growing area uh, and therefore regulates the wine production. The Vino de Pago is the exception in that it's an individual classification of producers. Uh, I say producers, they're using the term single estates here. Um, so it's producers with a high enough reputation to be considered a Vino de Pago. And you can kind of see here that there's only 14 of those Vino de Pagos uh, 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 listed or, or currently available. And all 14 of them are in Rioja or Ribera del Duero. And that's it, you guys. I, I know this, this is uh, meant to be a kind of a quick learning happy hour, if you will. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'll, I'll take a pause. I'm going to drink some more wine. I'll try to figure out how to put these PDFs somewhere. If you like the class, please, you know, tell somebody about it. Write a review. I'm actually really excited when we, you know, COVID has really produced a situation where we have to think outside the box. And all of us have seen these virtual tastings online and, you either like them or you don't. I'm, I'm one of them that does not really like them because they're not educational. There's, I don't really care what people are drinking in their glass. I want to know, I want to know about production. I want to know about history. I want to learn something, not just have a conversation about uh, kind of what people are drinking. Um, so I, I, I hope that this was um, enjoyable. If you enjoyed it, hopefully you take another class. And if not, uh, uh, I, it's okay. We'll probably continue this on in terms of an idea for the future even past COVID because it seems to be such a great idea uh, about uh, both get, sending, sending you wines and then obviously having those wines for you to share with yourself and friends and family. So I think there's some questions. <laughs> I really like the online format, no need to drive. I like it too. <clears throat> uh, Don, <laughs> Don, you're like my class clown. I just want to know which questions you will ask for the, for the trivia. Well, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a hard thing to say. I guess know what pandemics are. I think that's a good round of trivia. Very informational. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully the wines were good too, and, um, and uh, we'll continue it again on, uh, on Wednesday. Wednesday we talk about uh, Wednesday. I already opened the wines for Wednesday. If you don't have the wines for Wednesday, um, I think I can get some more. Uh, but we're talking about Vino Noble de Montepulciano, so we're talking about Tuscany and Sangiovese, and we're talking about California Cab. All right, you guys, I'm going to play some uh, outro music. I don't know if you heard the intro music, but here's some outro music. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good time. Drink your wine. We'll see you all soon. <laughs>